Hello, and welcome to Halo Innovations. Today we'll be going over how to import an SVG file, how to resize that file, create a model using the file, creating multiple copies of the model, and then creating a toolpath for the model. Starting off, be sure to take note of what unit of measurement your fusion is currently set to. If you have it set to millimeters and put in values thinking they're in inches, it can lead to issues with the toolpath later. You can enter values that are a different measurement than the one your fusion is set to, but you need to be sure that you enter in the proper abbreviation for the measurement when you do. For example, enter in 10 inches when inputting the length or width. Fusion will automatically convert that into millimeters or whatever other unit you may be using instead. The model that we'll be making today uh, will be cut on a Halo 2x2 plasma table, which has a cutting area of 23 inches by 22 inches, or 585 millimeters by 560 millimeters. In order to space our model properly on the table, it will be helpful for us to have a visual representation of how much space we have to work with. Using the sketch tool, create a rectangle with construction lines and enter in the cutting area on your plasma table. If anything we create falls outside of these lines, we will need to split our model to cut it in multiple steps. When we bring our SVG into Fusion, we'll need to resize it. To help us do that, we'll create a box off to the side using the sketch tool with construction lines. Make this box the size you want your model to be. Next, we'll go over three different ways to resize the SVG when you bring it in. So from the toolbar at the top, select Insert and then Insert SVG from the drop-down menu. After selecting which file to insert, choose which plane to work on and drag the image somewhere on the canvas that's convenient for you. When you bring it in, a menu will open up on the right side of the screen. In this menu, there's a line that says Scale. This is the first way that we can change the size of our image. It works on a percentage scale with 1.00 being 100%. It isn't super accurate, but it is useful for roughly scaling to an approximate size. After scaling to a size, close to what you're looking for, click OK. Upon doing that, your image will highlight green. This indicates that the image is locked and cannot be moved or altered. To unlock it, look for the icon on the toolbar that looks like a lock. If you don't see it on the toolbar, click the button that says Constraints and find the tool called Fix Unfix from the drop-down menu. After selecting the tool, highlight the image and release the mouse button. The image should turn blue, which means that it is no longer locked. When you have a tool selected, you can deselect it by pressing the Escape key. The second way that we can change the size of our SVG is Sketch Scale. Click Modify and select Sketch Scale. Then highlight the image and click on Point from the, the menu that opened up and select a point on the image. This will be the anchor point when scaling. Drag the arrow that appears on top of your image, either left or right, until it fits inside the box, or mostly fits inside the box. It doesn't have to be perfect. Reposition if needed to get a better fit. The third way that we can change the size of this RSVG is Sketch Dimension. While still in the sketch environment, click Create from the toolbar and uh, in this menu select Point. This tool lets you add points to a shape or an image. We will be adding a point on the top or bottom, uh, sorry, top and bottom of the image, since the next resizing method needs points in specific places to work correctly. In order for this next resizing method to work, you will first need to enable the Scale Entire Sketch at First Dimension option in your preferences. Once you have that enabled, you can select the Sketch Dimension tool from the toolbar and select the two points you've added to the image. You can then enter in a value for the dimension, in my case it is the diameter. 
This method is much more specific than in the other two. We'll now extrude this shape to make it easier to work with and to help visualize how the model will look once we cut it out on the table. Select Extrude from the toolbar or press the E key. Select the parts of your image that you want to extrude and decide how much to extrude it by. The value doesn't actually matter, it is purely for visual representation. For, uh, next, move the part into the cutting area box. When attempting to move the model, be sure that the line that says Move Object in the menu on the right side says Bodies. The next tool we'll be using is the Rectangular Pattern. To use this tool, we'll need to create some more construction lines to give it a path to follow. Select Sketch and click the button for construction lines. Then select the Line tool. Create two lines of any lengths on the X and Y axis. Now that we have our guidelines created, we can use the Rectangular Pattern tool by going to Create, finding the Pattern tool, and then clicking Rectangular Pattern. When the next menu opens up on the right hand side, make sure that it says Bodies on the Object Type line, and then be sure that the Objects line is lit up blue, and select the model. After that, click the button on the Axes line, and select the two lines that we made earlier. Once you've done that, a new menu will pop up on the right side. In this menu, look for the sections that say Axis 1 and Axis 2. In these sections, enter how many copies of the model you want on each, on each axis. Keep in mind how big your model is and how big your cutting area is. Once you've decided on a number, drag the arrows on the model out to the X and Y axes until you de your desired number of models fits into the cutting area. Keep at least 4mm between the models to accommodate for the plasma cutter's curve. Just to simplify this video and not take too much time, I'm going to reduce this to only one row and uh, do the toolpath for just that one row. I just wanted to show how you can create one copy at a time as well just in case you didn't need a whole row. So what you can do is you can right click on what the model that you want to create a copy of, choose move copy. On the right hand side, make sure where it says move object, it says bodies. Click on the, the model once again, and then on the right hand side, go down to the bottom of the menu and click create copy. Then when you drag the model, it will just be a copy of that model. And you can keep do this you know, however many times you need to in order to create multiple copies. Now that we have our models all set up and ready to go, we'll move into the manufacturing environment. This can be done by selecting design from the top left of the screen and then selecting manufacture from the drop down menu. Once there, select setup from the toolbar and click new setup. In this menu, while stock point is highlighted, click the white dot in the bottom left corner of the bounding box around your models. Then click the button you see under the model heading in the menu and select all of your models so that they light up blue. Next click the button on the toolbar that looks like a plasma cutter and says cutting. A new menu will open up on the right side of the screen once again. In the first tab of this menu, the only thing we will look at for now is the line that says tool. Click the button and select a tool to use from your tool library. If you need to import a tool library still, you can download one from our website. Or you can create your own tools if, you don't, if yours don't match our settings. 
Be sure to select the tool based on the amperage and tip size of the tool you'll be using on your plasma table. Next we'll move on to the geometry tab. In this tab we'll be selecting the edges of our model to tell Fusion that what we will need to be cutting. We're going to need to create two toolpaths since some of the areas that we have on our model are quite a bit smaller than other parts of it and won't be able to have the same settings because of that. You will notice that a red arrow shows up on the lines of your model once you select them for the geometry. This arrow indicates what direction the torch will travel while cutting. You will also notice that the lines inside of the model and the lines on the outside of the model have the arrow pointing in opposite directions. This is because when the torch is cutting, the straightest edge of the cut is always on the right side of the plasma arc. So the outside edges are all cut in a clockwise motion, while the inside edges are all cut in a counterclockwise motion. Tolerance is what we tell Fusion is the allowable difference between our model and the toolpath that Fusion will generate. You generally want this to be low, about 0.01 to 0.04, but be careful not to set it too low as this can cause some issues if you have a high feed rate or an older plasma table. We want sideways compensation to be set to left. This will place the torch on the left side of the edge of the model however far away in order to compensate, compensate for the kerf that your plasma cutter will have. Compensation type should be set to in computer. We'll set the finishing overlap to zero. Outer corner mode will be set to roll around due to our model having a lot of rounded corners in it. If you have a lot more straight edges in your, in your model, then you'll want to select keep corners sharp. And finally, we will select smoothing. This reduces the number of points on our toolpath, thereby reducing the lines of code that will be generated as well. Uh, the last tab in the menu is linking. On the left side of the screen, you'll see a few examples of how changing the settings in this tab can affect your lead-ins and lead-outs. You'll also see some examples using linear lead-ins and lead-outs as well. If your model is going to use a lead-in, make sure that you have lead-in entry selected. Lead-in radius makes our lead-in an arc rather than a straight line, and dictates the length of the radius in the arc. Lead-in sweep angle is the angle that our lead-in will be placed on, and lead-in distance is the linear line of the lead-in. We'll set our radius to 5mm, the angle to 120, and the lead-in distance to 0. I generally use either lead-in radius or lead-in distance, and very rarely, if ever, do I use both. Make sure to select the lead-out option as well as the same as lead-in option. This tells Fusion to use the same values for our lead-out that our lead-in has. Pierce clearance can be set to zero for this. It can be useful if there isn't enough room to have a lead-in, but the times that you'll use it are very few and far between. When choosing preferred lead-ins, look for areas on the model that, we ha that have enough space to perform the lead-in. I should note that if you choose not to use preferred lead-ins, Fusion will automatically generate them. You'll just need to make sure that they are in locations that work for your model. After selecting the lead-in positions, click OK and Fusion will generate the toolpath. Once it finishes, if it looks correct, go ahead and edit the toolpath to add the other models to this toolpath as well. After the toolpath is generated, if it looks good and nothing needs to be changed, we can then move on to the second toolpath. Most of the settings will stay the same. The only differences will be in geometry and linking. In geometry, select the edges that weren't selected in the first toolpath. All the settings in the passes tab will be the same as before, and then we'll just move into the linking tab. Things will be a little bit different here due to the areas we're working with being smaller than before, some of them only having up around 2mm in places. We will deselect the options for lead in and lead out, we could still have one but it would be very small and would only reduce the divots by a minimal amount. When you're not able to do a lead in or a lead out, you'll want to select a location where the divot will be less noticeable or very easily hidden. Areas to avoid are inside corners, whereas outside corners are usable for hiding the pierce hole. If the toolpath looks good, go ahead and add the rest of the models to the second toolpath.
When you have multiple toolpath profiles, you will need to arrange the profiles in the correct order for a successful cut. Make sure that your outside edge is always the last profile to be cut. As you can see, the outside edge of our model is located in profile one. So as a good habit, we're gonna rename both of the profiles, the first one being outside edge and the second one being inside cuts. Next, we'll post process our toolpath. Right click on setup and select post process from the drop down menu. You can also shift click both of the profiles and right click and post process from there. Next, we'll rename our file. After you rename the file and choose an output folder, click post on the bottom right hand corner of this menu. Once you see the NC code successfully posted down in the bottom right hand corner, that means that everything worked out nicely and we're ready to take this to our plasma table. Thanks for watching.